I'd like to talk today about how far we could go toward engaging the whole world in thinking about what to do about this problem of climate change, which does, in fact, affect all of us. Now, like at least several other people here in the room today, I was at the Paris Climate Talks about a month ago. And like many other people, I think the agreement reached at that conference was a very important step in the right direction. But it was only a step. It was only a start toward what really needs to be done. Even if all the countries reached all the voluntary goals they specified in the documents that were referred to in the agreement, even if all of that happened, there would still be significant risks of damage from climate change. And everyone I've talked to says that virtually none of the countries have any kind of detailed plans about how they're actually going to do the things they specified in those goals. So there's clearly a lot of work left to do. And this is not just work that needs to be done by the kinds of national governments that were represented at the conference. They have a crucial role to play, but they can't begin to solve the problem all by themselves. To do that, we need to involve businesses, scientists, universities, NGOs, all kinds of individuals and organizations all over the planet. Now, there's an obvious way of doing that, and that is by having lots and lots of meetings. We could have big meetings like the one in Paris, little ones, like, or smaller ones anyway, like the one here today, uh, or like the MIT Solve conference last fall. We need to have legislative sessions. We need to have town hall meetings. We need to have simulation games of the sort that Larry was just talking about. We need to have scientific conferences. We need to have lots and lots of meetings of lots of different types. We certainly need meetings like that. But what if there were a way of dramatically accelerating this process, a way of involving far more people, far more rapidly, and far more constructively than we could do in any amount of face-to-face -face meetings we're likely to actually organize. It turns out there is a new way of approaching really big, hard, complicated problems that wasn't even possible 20 years ago. Think of Google, for instance, where thousands of people all over the world have collectively created a very large and amazingly high quality intellectual product with almost no centralized control. And by the way, in most cases, without even being paid. Or think of the Linux open source operating system. This wasn't developed by a big company like IBM or Microsoft or any kind of hierarchical organization like that. This system was developed by a loose community of software developers all over the world, each of whom was working on whatever they wanted to work on whenever and wherever they wanted to work on it. And yet out of that global online community came what is certainly one of the best and most important computer operating systems in the world today. Or think of Foldit an online multiplayer video game designed specifically to let people work on complicated problems of how to fold protein molecules. One of the many things they've done in this community is figure out how to solve a particular complex folding problem that may well play an important role in treatment for AIDS. This was a problem that had evaded solution in the scientific community for over a decade. This online community solved the problem in about three weeks. Now the question that raises is, could it be possible to use this online crowdsourcing approach to help us figure out what to do about the problem of global climate change? I think the answer to that question is, 
absolutely yes. And that's what we've been doing now for several years in the Climate CoLab project here at MIT. We've developed an online, we developed an online platform uh, and a worldwide community of over 50,000 people who are using this platform. The community includes some of the world's leading experts on climate change. It also includes business people, policymakers, students, NGO members, lots and lots of people. It's a very international community. About half of the people in our community are from outside the US. It's also a well-educated community. Almost 60% have some amount of graduate school experience. And all the people in this community are developing and evaluating proposals for what to do about different parts of the climate change problem. These proposals can include anything people want to suggest about technological changes, political, economic, legal, any other changes they want to suggest. Many of the proposals also allow people to use the built-in simulation, uh, computer simulation tools built into the platform to use those to estimate the likely impacts of the actions they propose on things like emissions and costs. Uh, we've divided or organized the activity in this community in terms of a set of contests on different parts of the climate change problem. For instance, we have contests on things from how to generate electricity with fewer emissions, to how to deal with rising sea level, to how to shift public attitudes about climate change. One of our contests, for instance, is about how the US could put a price on carbon. And as in all of our contests, we have expert advisors and judges for these contests. In this case, uh, the advisors included George Shultz, a former US Secretary of State, and two former members of the US House of Representatives, one Democrat and one Republican. The, uh, the, the experts in these contests play very important roles in helping to formulate the questions and the problems that people in the community work on. They help make sure that the relevant background material is there so that people will know the background things they need to do to do credible proposals about what to do about this problem. And of course, the expert judges also help evaluate the solutions that the people send in, both in terms of their likely impact and in terms of their potential feasibility. Now, having the experts is useful, but I think it's also useful to have these online crowds. They, for instance, allow us to explore lots more possibilities in parallel than any small group of experts could ever do. They can also sometimes bring to bear relevant local knowledge. For instance, one of our proposals a couple of years ago was from an NGO in India that had an idea about how small farmers in India could replace the diesel-powered irrigation pumps they were using with foot-powered treadle pumps, a low-tech solution, but one that was both much less expensive and, of course, much less emission intensive. Unlikely, not impossible, but unlikely that an MIT scientist in a laboratory here would have thought of that. Very interesting to have people right on the ground who can help think of things like that. Another benefit of having the online crowds involved is even in addition to whatever good ideas they contribute, just having them involved can help them. About 70% of our community members say they have learned either a lot or some from participating in the Climate CoLab community. And about 40% of them say they are now more convinced of the importance of taking action about climate change. So I think it's important to have both the experts and crowds involved. I think the organizing this as a series of online contests is also a powerful approach. It allows you to relatively easily find people who aren't yet part of the conversation but who have good ideas, to find good ideas that aren't yet in the mainstream but could be very important. And it allows you to systematically collect and compare all those different ideas, not only from the experts you know about, 
but from anyone else who may have a useful point of view. In fact, you might think that even in this case, most of the good ideas will come from experts, and certainly some do. But in one of the studies we did, we found that, a, that proposals were just as likely to become finalists if they came from people who did not have any climate change experience before than those who did, just as likely to become finalists if they came from people who did not have graduate school experience as those who did, just as likely to come from people outside the US as inside, and by the way, just as likely to come from women as from men. So I think it's useful to involve a very large spectrum of people in coming up with ideas about what we can do about this very important problem. Now, one thing you may be interested in is what are some of the ideas that have come out of this process? One of my favorites is for this device called the Sun Saluter. It's a solar panel that uses water and gravity to rotate over the course of the day so it follows the sun across the sky. By rotating in that way, it generates about 30% more electricity than a fixed solar panel. And here's the best part. As the water drips out to allow it to rotate, that water is filtered into clean drinking water. So the same low-cost device produces both electricity and clean water, two very important needs for hundreds of millions of people around the world. This idea came from a young woman named Eden Full, who was a Princeton dropout and has started a nonprofit organization to encourage entrepreneurs all over the world to manufacture and sell this device. Another of our grand prize winning ideas was for a system called HEAT that uses infrared photography from airplanes to notice which buildings on the ground are losing the most wasted heat, and then superimposing that information on Google Maps so that you can look at this website and see how much heat your house is losing compared to your neighbors. This idea came from a research group in Canada at the University of Calgary. Now, Many of the good ideas that come out of this process are not just technological ideas. They're about all kinds of other technical, legal, economic, things like that. For instance, one of my favorite proposals came a couple of years ago from an NGO in China about something they call the China Dream. So they were developing and promoting an aspirational lifestyle for Chinese consumers that would be much more environmentally sustainable than the American dream lifestyle. A very important thing to do if we really want to solve this problem. So these are examples of some of the kinds of ideas that have been coming out of our contests focused each on different parts of the problem. I think it's clear that some pretty interesting ideas can come, but I don't think that's the only thing we need to do to solve the whole problem. Even if you have great ideas about how to solve the problem as a whole, you still need to see how those ideas fit together and whether together they're enough to solve the overall problem. So starting last year, we've begun having a set of integrated contests where people create proposals that bring together ideas from all the other contests into integrated climate action plans at the national and global level. So our hope is that the Climate Collab will help scientists, policymakers, business people, students, and lots and lots of other people plan and gain support for better climate actions than anything we would ever otherwise have done. Thank you. Okay, we have time for a few questions. Yes. I was just curious, how much time does the judge have to commit 
evaluate the crowd musically? That's a really interesting question. Are you thinking of being a judge? <laughs> um, Can you repeat the question, please? Oh, the question is, how much time does a judge have to commit to evaluate the proposals? Uh, frankly, we've, been, we've tried to be easy on our judges, and we haven't required huge amounts of time, something on a number of hours of time that a judge has to commit to review proposals. Uh, but I think we need to do a better job. And one of the things we're looking at are some ways of getting more extensive evaluations from broader networks of people as well as the expert judges that we're involving. Does that answer your question? I, I, I just thought it was logistically a, a, a major problem <coughs> how to take a crowd and, and, yeah. and filter out well, one best solution. Okay, an important part of his, his question is logistically how can you filter out all the ideas from a big crowd? Uh, an important part of what we do, which I haven't mentioned yet, is we also have a set of what we call Climate Collab Fellows. These are what you might call semi-experts. Many of them are graduate students or relatively junior professionals who help organize more of the day-to-day -day operations of each of these contests. And they do a lot of preliminary screening of the uh, proposals before the, the reasonably plausible ones go to the expert judges. Other questions? Yes. How do you recruit people who wouldn't ordinarily think about climate emergency? A very good question. Uh, we've tried lots of things. We use mailing lists. Uh, we use Twitter. Uh, Facebook appears to have been a very powerful recruiting tool for us. Um, um, another powerful recruiting tool is people recruiting their friends, especially people who have proposals that they think are good. One of the things we do is, uh, among the finalist proposals, we let both judges pick a judge's choice winner among the ones the judges have said are good, and then we let the community vote for a popular choice winner among the finalists that the judges have selected. People often recruit friends to vote for their proposal, and that brings more people into the community who then can become involved in the future. <coughs> 